Um, and as I mentioned at the end of that uh, class, we were going to keep the Vimalakirti theme and the beat of Vimalakirti going for who knows for how long. Um, but the one thing I wanted to mention about, you know, tonight we're doing a new sutra. There's a fresh, fresh sutra. Um, but right from the get, you're going to start noticing similarities and you're going to be like, oh, wait, Michael, that was, that was in Vimalakirti. <laughs> Indeed, there's so many crossovers here that I thought this was, this will be a great sutra. But so A, I wanted to do this sutra because it's a, it's a, a, a great opportunity to, to review and go back over a bunch of those really interesting ideas from the Vimalakirti Sutra. But I also wanted to do this because that, that Vimalakirti Sutra, is a, it's really something else, you know, it's, it's really special. And as I was saying a lot at the last, uh, at the last class, you know, it's, it's quite a performance. It's a, the Sutra is kind of a performance to, to teach the Sutra is a performance. And, and what that means is I get, I, especially me, I can get quite, you know, performative in those classes. And as, uh, you know, wonderful or not as that might be, it, it doesn't allow, you know, a tremendous amount of room for questions and wrestling with a lot of the deeper ideas. And so it's a, uh, this sutra tonight is called the Ashoka Data. I have a ton, ton of stuff to say about Ashoka Data, that word, the idea. But I do want to just start tonight by saying, you know, I want to, this is a much kind of chiller pace than that Vimalakirti where I was sort of trying to, you know, because Michael and I had laid out a schedule. And so if I, you know, sort of missed a beat, we'd start slipping behind in that way. Whereas tonight we have no schedule. We could do a Shokadatu for weeks, months, years, you know, so, and I, I'm very open to that possibility. Um, and so with that being said, I just want to, you know, I haven't worked out all the, the best ways of fielding questions, but sort of just that kind of compassionate chaos has sort of worked so far in terms of everybody uh, respecting everybody sort of uh, going. So feel free to jump in. I'm going to jump in. Tonight we're doing uh, the Ashoka Data Sutra. Uh, it's the title of the sutra is going to be tricky. We're, I'm reading it from this, which is this, uh, a treasury of Mahayana Sutras. And what is a treasury of Mahayana Sutras? What is this book? Well, this is a partial translation and it's not complete it's a partial translation of the ratnakuta sutra this pile or peak or mound of jewels and actually what the ratnakuta sutra is is uh basically an anthology so it's a bunch of smaller sutras that are compiled together um I'm particularly interested in the Ratnakuta Sutra, all um, 49 of them. There are 49 small sutras that make up this pile of jewels. All 49 of them have not been translated in, into English yet. This book is 22 of them. One of, if not the most famous of the sutras, one of the most famous jewels in the heap is a sutra called the Lion's Roar of Queen Srimala. And it's a, it's a famous sutra because it's about a female, a queen, who gives the lion's roar this sort of, well, actually, Ashoka Data tonight, or maybe, maybe tonight, but in this sutra, it will give the lion's roar. So I just want you to know that this is a famous sutra that comes from this pile that it's been translated a number of times, actually. There's a sutra called the Upaya Sutra or the Skill and Means Sutra also comes out of this collection. So now we're at what, 22, 23, 24, right? Um, there's this one that I use a lot, Diana Paul's Women in Buddhism. She translates parts of a number of the jewels, a number of the sutras that are in this. She translates portions of them. Uh, so this is a great resource for uh, Ratnakuta studies, right? Um, and so one of the things I wanted to share with you really quickly about all these jewels, about the Ratnakuta, the whole pile, 
is that, again, there's 49 sutras. Uh, the English-speaking world knows, about, knows of about half of them. And if you uh, read Chinese, then you can read all 49. If you read Sanskrit, you can read almost all 49 of them. And if you look at all 49 of them, they're kind of, well, actually, you know, it's interesting, historically, meaning traditionally scholarly, this sutra is treated as a, um, ah, just a miscellaneous pi pile. They called it a, a kuta because it's just a big pile of miscellaneous sutras. I, I beg to differ. There's, there's really, really a very strong uh, through line through all these sutras, really tying them all together in a very interesting way. I, I think it's, a, it's, it's sort of a very yin a yin kind of a collection where the, the threads are loose and it is an anthology where you don't have sutras and characters from sutras uh, passing over into other sutras. They're all standalone in that way. But there are these kind of, um, well, some of the sutras are called nirdeshas, advice. And that might sound familiar because of the Vimala Kirti Nirdesha Sutra. That's right, the Vimalakirti Sutra is a nirdesha, it, where it is the advice, the sagely advice of somebody or so-and-so. And in fact, many of the 49 jewels are nirdesha sutras. They are the advice of this person or the advice of that person. People, by the way, that are not the Buddha, right? That's kind of relevant. Um, there is also something called paripricha, and there are a bunch of the sutras that are the, like the Ugra Paripricha. I think you can kind of see it there. This is a book by Jan Natier, amazing scholar, Jan Natier. Um, and these books, this is a sort of, a lot of these sutras are about the Bodhisattva path. And so this is the questions. So not the advice, but the questions of Ugra, the Ugra Paripricha. This is the Rastrapali. Hari Precha, the questions of Rashtrapala, right? And so you get these sutras that are the advice of so-and-so or the questions of so-and-so. There's a number of the 49 that are vyuhas, the, the um, Sukhavati vyuha, the Akshobhya vyuha. So a vyuha is a... Um, well, you can think of it as a pure land sutra, the description of these other lands, right? The other worlds, these Buddha lands. Interestingly, though, the word vyuha is like an arrangement or an array, um, kind of like a, bu a bouquet, right? Where you don't get a bouquet in nature. You have to like assemble it, right? To make a beautiful bouquet out of flowers. So a vyuha is like an arrangement, a presentation of a, you know, of a bunch of ideas. In addition to all of those types of sutras, there's two more that I want to mention. Uh, one, actually, I already mentioned it. It's the lion's roar, like Queen Srimala. And this is what's interesting, is that in these sutras, the, the, all the Ratnakuta sutras, in most of the ones that I've really carefully studied, at some point, somebody gives the lion's roar. It's kind of a theme. But there's only one of the 49 sutras. There's only one that is called the lion's roar of, and it happens to be Queen Srimala. It happens to be a female. That's interesting. Then there's the final one that I wanted to tell you about, which is this uh, Vyakarana, a prophecy. And this is the tricky word, the, the a tricky idea, uh, uh, Vyakarana, in the early days of Buddhist studies, like at the turn of the turn of the 20th century, when like the Theosophical Society was all getting into Buddhist studies, and Madame Blavatsky and the Colonel were down in Southeast Asia <laughs> studying. They were like, "Ooh, prophecies! Yes, Nostradamus, tell us what is the future." Sadly, that is not what a Vyakarana is. There's this motif in all of these sutras where it is the Buddha, the Buddha, the historical Buddha, Siddhartha, Shakyamuni, 
making a prophecy that in the, a future life, so-and-so will become a fully enlightened Buddha, right? And this is a theme in many sutras where, you know, the discourse is going back and forth and back and forth and it's get da 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 And then, you know, it reaches this like peak moment and the Buddha says, ah, now Bodhisattva so-and-so will in the future life become Buddha. And they always have these beautiful names. So that's a theme. It's a theme throughout a bunch of different sutras, not just Ratnakuta sutras of, of these prophecies that in the future you will become a Buddha. But it's interesting that in the Ratnakuta collection, even though there are many declarations of future Buddhahood, there is only one sutra that is called a, a, a Vyakarana Sutra, and it is the Ashoka Datta Vyakarana Sutra. Ah, I did it. Ah, that's the big introduction to the sutra. So this is about this bestowing of a prophecy of Buddhahood, of full Buddhahood, on this bodhisattva Ashoka Datta. So that's just where the sutra comes from. Now we're going to open up the treasury, right? And now we're going to actually get into it. Um, this is Sutra, the 32nd, Sutra number 32. Even though in this book, it's Sutra number seven, it is actually number 32. And actually, the order of these sutras is seemingly quite significant. So as you get closer to Sutra number 49, um, just want to point that out. The Chinese title of this is, is even trickier because we have two things going on with this collection. We have the Chinese, which is what the sutra is actually called in Chinese. And then we have the title that this translation committee gave the sutra. And then there is the Sanskrit title of the sutra. <laughs> Are you confused yet? So these people translate this, like what is this sutra called? This sutra is called The Prophecy of the Bodhisattva Fearless Virtues, Attainment of Buddhahood. So they're interesting, what they're doing there is, is that they're giving you the English title, which is referencing the original Sanskrit title, Ashoka Datta Bodhisattva. The Ashoka Datta means fearless virtue. Okay, and so this is the Vyakarana, the prophecy of Bodhisattva fearless virtues, attainment of Buddhahood. So that's actually kind of a, you know, a very verbatim translation of the Sanskrit title. The Chinese is this, Wu Wei De, fearless De, Fearless virtue, and that's where the translation of Ashoka Datta starts to get very tricky. So, indeed, this word Ashoka in Sanskrit, yeah, it, it means fearless. If you're familiar with the uh, kind of famous or infamous uh, Indian or you know, um, ruler, emperor named Ashoka from fifth, you know, what, third century BC. It's a famous name. Fam this emperor Ashoka is like Constantine, very famous. And what a Ashoka without, uh, without Shoka. Ashoka actually means without sorrow, without regret. <laughs> That's quite a name for a, an emperor who led a vicious conquest uh, to, to kind of unify the subcontinent of India. It, it's, it's notoriously a, a bloody conquest. And so a name like Ashoka is like, wow. And so this word, this idea in, in, in like Sanskrit, in like the big milieu of Indian culture, it's helpful to know that it means without sorrow or without regret. In Buddhism, Ashoka kind of more means like fearless, brave, and it is certainly what Wei means, without fear. And this idea of Wei, 
is is big in Buddhism. I mean, it, I mean, the Buddha or the Bodhisattvas are called bestowers of fearlessness. It's like that's the that's what they have come to bring humanity is to be fearless, to have no fear, to not be afraid. And so you see in Chinese Buddhist texts, you see way a lot for this idea of fearless. Whereas you actually in Chinese don't see the idea of Ashoka that much. So it's interesting there. And then the duh, this is where it starts to get very interesting. If you're familiar with the famous Chinese poem called the Tao De Qing, this is the duh of the Tao De Qing, right? This is the virtue. So the way and virtue, the Tao, the way, and virtue, duh, the, the jing, the, the classic concerning the way, and duh, virtue. So, the, of course, if a Chinese like philosopher or someone sees this, fearless duh, that's like, oh, oh, wow, tell me more. So there's an interesting choice of terms here with this idea of, of virtue, duh. But it's tricky, though, because Ashoka Datta, D-A-T-T-A. Datta is a very interesting idea. It is etymologically right there with dana, D-A-N-A, which is to give. But data is, it, data basically, it still has the, the, the connotation of giving. But what is wrapped up actually in dana and virtue and data, data rather than dana being this, Data is actually like uh, sharing, actually. What data means in Sanskrit is to split up. It's like if, if, if like basically like if we picked a bunch of apples and I gave you half and took half for me, we data, we data up the apples, we divided them. So there's this idea of sort of equally sharing in that. Whereas dana is like, you don't have any apples. <laughs> I, I got apples. And so I dana. I dana you the apples because you don't have any apples. Whereas data is more of this idea of, of sharing in that way. Regardless, what's, what's going on in the sutra tonight is a whole discourse about giving, receiving, and the virtue or punya or merit, which is another uh, Bud a bunch of Buddhist ideas that are wrapped up in this Chinese de is punya or merit, and it's about the merit that is acquired from giving. So all of that is wrapped up in this idea of giving, getting merit, and all of that, and then we're going to be introduced to this bodhisattva of fearless merit-making, <laughs> right? That's kind of what's buried in these ideas. Like, if you, if you try to get too stuck on, like, well, is it fearless giving? Or is it fearless receiving? Or is it fearless merit from, it's like, don't get too hung up on, is it the giving? Is it the get, getting? Is it the gift? It's like fearless merit making. Okay. That is the title. Now we've done where the sutra comes from and what the title is. <laughs> Any questions or comments or ideas before we really dig into some Dharma? Great. We're off to a great start. Um, so I think I'll start reading it. I have a, a few ideas, these ideas in particular that I want to talk about. Um, they come up in the text. Um, let's just see how it goes. So now we know there's this very interesting collection of sutras, the Ratnakuta. We've taken one of those gems out, right? We're going to brush that off. And that's this Ashoka Datta Sutra. Thus have I heard. Once the world honored one was dwelling on the vulture's peak, Mount Gridrakuta, near the great city of Rajgriha, the capital of Magadha, accompanied by 500 monks. And countless Bodhisattva Mahasattvas were also present. 
8,000 of them at the head. And these leaders, these great leaders, had all acquired samadhis, concentrations, and dharanis. Hmm. Dharanis are kind of like mantras, but they're actually kind of like spells in a way. So these, all these great bodhisattva leaders had acquired samadhi concentration and dharani spells. They had penetrated well into emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness, the three doors of liberation. They had acquired a good command of bala, the miraculous powers, and they had achieved the realization of the non-origination of all phenomena, the realization of the non-arising of all dharmas. Among the bodhisattvas were Bodhisattva Maru, Bodhisattva Mahamaru, Bodhisattva constantly entering samadhi, Bodhisattva ever vigorous, Bodhisattva precious hand, Ratnahasta, actually jeweled hand, is that Bodhisattva? Bodhisattva roots of constant joy, Bodhisattva worthy strength, Bodhisattva precious form, Bodhisattva Rahu, Bodhisattva Chakra, the god of the sky, and Bodhisattva god of water, Bodhisattva high aspiration, Bodhisattva superior aspiration, and Bodhisattva intense aspiration and so forth. During the World Honor One's stay near the great city of Rajgriha, the king, princes, brahmins, and elders, and all lay devotees all worshipped, praised, and made offerings to the Buddha. At that time, the World Honored One was teaching the Dharma to incalculable hundreds of thousands of millions of followers who surrounded him respectfully. And then one morning, in accordance with the rules, numerous shravakas, disciples, renunciants, including the Venerable Shariputra, the Venerable Mahamadgulyayana, the Venerable Mahakashyapya, the Venerable Shibuti, the Venerable Purnamaitreya Yanaputra, the Venerable Ravata, the Venerable Ashvajit, the Venerable Upali, the Venerable Rahula, and Venerable Ananda, all dressed in their monastic robes and holding bowls in their hands, went into the great city of Rajgriha for the sole purpose of begging for food from house to house. Begging in this way, these Shravakas gradually approached the palace where King Ajatashatru lived. When they arrived there, they stood in silence to one side without saying whether they wanted any food or not. King Ajatashatru, King Ajatashatru had a daughter named Ashoka Datta, fearless virtue, a maiden of incomparable beauty and grace. She had achieved the most distinctive merits in the world, although she was only 12 years old. She was sitting with golden jeweled shoes on her feet in her royal father's hall when she saw the Shravakas arrive. She did not stand up to welcome them, but sat in silence, not exchanging greetings with them, not saluting them or asking them to be seated. Seeing Ashoka Datta sitting silently, King Ajatashatru asked her, Do you not know that these men are the, are the foremost disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha? Do you not know that they have achieved the great Dharma and that they are fields of blessings for the world? It is out of compassion for sentient beings that they beg for food. Now that you have seen them, why do you not stand and welcome them? Why not salute them, exchange greetings with them, and ask them to be seated? Now, what on earth do you have in mind that keeps you from standing up and welcoming these shravakas? Boy. 
do I need to explain like what's at stake here, right? <laughs> this is, so the first thing of course is Ajatha Shatru for all intent, for all we know is a historical figure. He appears in many Buddhist suttas, the older uh, sutras of the, like the Pali tradition. Um, and insofar as those Pali suttas can be kind of trusted as historical documents, it does seem that the Buddha and Ajatha Shatru had contact. Ajatha Shatru would go to the Buddha for advice. That's the content of many sutras. Well, you know, like I've said in so many of these Mahayana sutras, this text, no, it knows that this is not history. Ajatha Shatru, to our knowledge, did not have a daughter, definitely not a daughter named Ashokadatta. It's like, so this sutra is right from the get uh, a parable where these things are significant. They stand for things right away. I hope everybody noticed these are almost the same 10 Shravakas from the Vimalakirti Sutra in almost the exact same order. So you start to notice a, what would be called a trope and this trope of having these Shravakas going from Shariputra, the, the oldest, wisest of the group, all the way to Ananda, the youngest, you know, most group, uh, wet behind the ears of the group. So this is a, a, a trope, a form. But what's really going on here, like, like this idea that this 12-year-old girl is not standing up when these elders, they are all standing and they have come begging for food. Well, I mean... You know, this is, this is huge. This is huge. This, this is so much, there's, you know, seniority. Seniority is just the tip of the iceberg of what is being um, shirked here, right? In that way where the youngest is not bowing to the oldest by, a, by any stretch of the imagination. But even more significant than that is that the female is not bowing to the males. That's where it's like, you know, from a Theravada, that type of, of, of Buddhism, of which the Shravakas, that's what they represent. You know, that's, in fact, if you don't know, you know, that's sort of a very, a point of contention in the Theravada world today, which is that there's a rule in that monastic community, which is that the the a, a a nun even if she's been ordained for 80 years needs to bow to a monk who just got ordained that day that there is this weird rule that nuns always must follow behind the monks um there's obviously a lot of rules around contact with opposite sex and all of that that that's not what actually this is about this is about um uh, 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 folks, this is about righteous indignation tonight. This is about, that's why fearless virtue is about speaking truth to power, speaking truth to authority. And, and I, so I didn't want to get to Ashoka Datta's lion's roar without you knowing that that's what's at stake here. And that it's, this is, yeah, this is a story. This is a bedtime story, but man, this is a very powerful message that, you know, even if you're the most conservative, critical historian and scholar, this sutra is at least 2,000 years old. It is at least from the year zero. It is most likely several hundred years older than that even, but it is guaranteed going back at least 2,000 years in a culture, a world in which these dynamics of male female hierarchy seniority hierarchy this is serious business and so <laughs> hear the roar right i want i just want you to hear that and and hear the message though he I, and we're you know we're gonna go through it but ashoka data asked her father has your majesty ever seen or heard of a universal monarch standing up to welcome minor kings? <laughs> King Ajatashatru answered, no. 
Ashoka Dutta said, has your majesty ever seen or heard of a lion, the king of beasts, rising to welcome jackals? No. Has your majesty ever heard of of a chakra god receiving his celestial subjects or that Brahma saluting his celestial subjects? The king replied, no. Ashoka Datta said, has your majesty ever seen or heard of the god of a vast ocean paying homage to the god of a river or to the god of a pond? No. Has your majesty ever seen or heard of the king of mountains, Sumeru, paying homage to a hill? <laughs> no. Has your majesty ever seen or heard of the god of the sun or the god of the moon saluting fireflies? <laughs> the king replied, no. The maiden, Ashoka Datta replied, therefore, your majesty, why should a bodhisattva who in great kindness and compassion has vowed to pursue supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, why should such a person pay homage to shravakas of the little vehicle who have neither great compassion nor great kindness? Your majesty, why should one who follows the path leading to supreme enlightenment who is like a lion, the king of beasts, salute those who follow the small vehicle, who are like jackals. Your majesty, if one is already engaged in a vigorous effort to seek the great pure path, should they associate with shravakas of the small path with such few roots of good virtue? Your majesty, if a person wishes to go to a sea of great wisdom to seek a thorough knowledge of the great Dharma in its entirety, do they bother to turn to Shravakas whose knowledge, based on the Buddha's oral teachings, is, a li as, is as limited as the water in a cow's hoof print? Your majesty, if one wishes to reach supreme Buddhahood, the spiritual Mount Sumeru, and acquire the infinite body of a Tathagata, should they pay homage to Shravakas, who seek only as much samadhi power as could be contained in the space of a tiny mustard seed? Your majesty, the merits and wisdom of Shravakas may be compared to the light of a firefly, because their illumination can only benefit themselves. And their understanding of Dharma comes only through hearing the Buddha's oral teachings. If a person has already learned of the merits and wisdom of Tathagatas, which may be likened to the sunlight and moonlight, should they salute Shravakas? Your Majesty, I will not pay homage to Shravakas even after the Buddha enters Nirvana, let alone now when the world honor one still remains in the world. Why? Your Majesty, the reason is one who associates closely with Shravakas will vow to attain Shravakahood. And one who associates closely with solitary sages, Pratekya Buddhas, they will vow to attain solitary enlightenment, protect your Buddhahood. And one who associates closely with the supremely enlightened, one will vow to attain supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. Okay, I'm going to pause there. So one of the reasons why I really wanted to do, there's so many sutras that tie into Vimalakirti. The one reason why I chose this one is because of such, it has in, in all, actually, all of my Dharma studies, all of my sutra studies, it has the clearest treatment of what's wrong with shravakas and what's so great about bodhisattvas. <laughs> that, that discourse, that there's something wrong with the Hinayana, there's something wrong with the Theravada, there's something wrong with the shravaka path, 
the discourse that there's something wrong with the Shravaka path and there's something better or whatever about the Bodhisattva path, that's like at the heart of so many Mahayana sutras is trying to extol the virtues of, of Bodhisattva-ness, Bodhisattvahood, and trying to show the shortcomings of what is called the Shravaka yana, the Shravaka path. And again, this for me is one of the clearest. So one of the lines that's very clear here is this idea that, that the Shravaka has only enough illumination to illuminate themselves, right? That's sort of, there's, there's more to come. Um, there's much more to come about Ashoka Dutta's kind of critique of the solitary path. So I'm not going to give them all away, but I just want you to know that that is what's going on in the sutra and that those little, well, first of all, that lovely list of, you know, does the king of mountains greet a hill? Does the, you know, that's like very, again, this is very, uh, this is a very empowering sutra in that way, right? So to have a 12-year-old girl saying, you know, <laughs> that's some powerful stuff. So questions about where we're at up to this point? Cool. Um, so I do want to talk about these three doors of liberation. So I'm going to have to, unfortunately, I'm going to skip. So there's, um, like, like all great Mahayana sutras, Ashoka Datta now busts out into verse <laughs> in which she says ma many of the same things she just said and more in verse, in poetic verse. And so I, I'm not going to uh, go into those, unfortunately. Um, well, just on the point, I will notice this one, just on that tension between the, the solitary enlightened one, the Shravaka and the Bodhisattva, um, the, she says um, that it's like a person who ventures to sea seeking a great fortune and yet returns only with one coin. <laughs> so precisely do Shravakas behave, but having reached, the great, having reached the great ocean of Dharma, they disregard the treasures of the Mahayana and engender only the narrow aspiration to follow the small vehicle, right? If one engenders a narrow aspiration, seeking his, his or her own deliverance only, not others, then just like a minor doctor who can only cure themselves, they deserve no respect from the wise. So there's another big critique. And I, I just want to plant this seed before I get to the next part. This critique, you know, is an old one. This, this is dialogue, this discourse has been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries. But I want you to know that there, it's still kind of applicable to today's world of spirituality in terms of kind of a spiritual tradition that might be hyperly focused on one's own liberation and, not, and kind of maybe miss that, that you're never going to get liberated that way. Never with any hyper focus on the self is just is failed or doomed and it does seem that maybe the theravada path with its focus on deep samadhi deep meditation for one's own liberation it seems like that might have come to the end of the road so to speak and the bodhisattva path is again about this sort of a concern about everyone's liberation concern about all enlightenment okay so I'm skipping the bulk of the, po the beautiful poetry, jumping to the next kind of nice section here. Then af after that, King Ajata Shatru reproached Ashoka Datta saying, you arrogant little girl, how dare you not welcome these Shravakas when you see them? The maiden Ashoka Datta said, do not say that your majesty. Your majesty is arrogant too. Why do you not welcome all of the poor of Rajgriha to your home? Oh, burn. Burn, right? Why don't you invite everybody? Right? So that's great. The king answered. Listen to, listen to his answer. They are not my peers. 
oh, the poor are not my peers, right? Why should I welcome them into my house, right? The maiden Ashoka Dutta said, a novice bodhisattva is also like that. No Shravaka or solitary Pratekya Buddha is her peer. <laughs> the king asked his daughter, do you not know that the Bodhisattva respects all sentient beings? Oh, he tried to flip it on her. He tried to get smart. Oh, you think you're a Bodhisattva? Don't all Bodhisattvas, you know, revere all sentient beings? Right? Do not. Do you not know that Bodhisattvas respect all sentient beings? Ashoka Datta answered, Your Majesty, a Bodhisattva respects them all in order to save the arrogant, irate beings, and make them turn their minds towards supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. It is in order to augment sentient beings' good roots that a Bodhisattva extends respect to all. However, Shravakas are already free of anger and hatred and are unable to increase their good roots. Your Majesty, even though hundreds of thousands of Buddhas explain the wonderful subtle Dharma to them, they will not improve in discipline, meditation, or samadhi. Your Majesty, a Shravaka is like a lump of lapis lazuli unable to contain anything but a bodhisattva <clears throat> but a bodhisattva is like a precious container your majesty a bottle which is full cannot take in even a drop of rain from the sky in the same way a shravaka even after hundreds of thousands of buddhas tathagatas have explained the wonderful subtle dharma to them they cannot be helped or improved in discipline, meditation, or wisdom. Nor can, nor can they cause sentient beings to aspire to all-knowing wisdom. Okay. Michael, can I ask a quick question? It's a perfect time for that. Great, thanks. I mentioned it on the chat and um, recognized that you didn't, that you don't read those. So I'll just um, ask. I thought even with his dying words, you know, that the historical Buddha said, you know, be a lamp unto yourself, work out your own salvation diligently. No one else can do this for you. You've got to do the work yourself. Like, this is not something like, you know, just in the name of Jesus you know, everybody can be saved kind of thing. And so there, there's something that I find kind of, um, and I have always vacillated between the Theravadan and the Mahayan uh, tradition because of this kind of, this question. I mean, maybe it's to do with how large you define self. Um, but, but I just thought I'd, I'd ask that because... It, I love this this story. It's just it just yeah, kind yeah. of buzzed up against that for me. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. Now oh great. I was sort of like, mm, mm, but now I know where you're coming from. Yeah. So here. So here's the deal. You know, you're right. That is sort of a rid an, an original injunction of the Buddha is to sort of be ye lamps unto yourself. Don't believe anything is true because you read it, because somebody told you, or, or even because the Buddha said it. You only believe things are true because you yourself have, have uh, experienced the truthfulness of them. And, you know, from the diamonds, the Vajra Sutra, the idea you got to let that the Dharma is just a raft and you got to let the raft go after you get to the other side. That's the Dharma. That's the teaching from day one. The critique. I think from what would be called the Mahayana point of view is that a group of conservative elders lost sight of the Dharma. And as the way that I teach this when I'm more of the historian is that it does seem that, you know, Buddhism as a kind of meditation uh, movement in India, it seems like it, it went along pretty good for a hundred, 200 years. 
And then it became an institution. It became a hierarchy with all the pitfalls of hierarchies and institutions. And so there was a kind of a revival movement of which the sutra that we're reading tonight is part of. It's sort of like a, this, hey, everybody, we missed the message that, the, that he told us about. Originally, this is, not the, this is not a new message. This is like, hey, everybody, we forgot the old message. <laughs> Because if we're discriminating based on age, sex, gender, race, you name it, we're not doing, we're not practicing the Dharma. We're not doing the thing. Lost the plot there, yeah. Exactly. And so this is very much addressing sort of very, exactly what your comment was about. Okay, thank you. That helps yes. because it helps me reconcile some of the questions I had about the Kuni ordination and um, and my own personal aspiration for for being um, ordained and not being able to be um, in in that tradition and not wanting to be subservient to a freshly you know monked out guy. I I just decided not to be a, a nun in this life because of that. And and look, twenty five hundred years ago, right? His his stepmom got ordained. Yeah, so, yeah. Clearly, yeah, yeah, there was some something lost there. Indeed, you know, and I think that you know, I've seen even you know the last few days, um, you know, uh, people really connecting with this original anti-caste message of Buddhism. That Buddhism from the beginning was anti-caste, anti-hierarchy, and, and to a certain degree, anti. Um, uh, uh, sexual discrimination because the Buddha was like, yeah, enlightenment for everybody. Let's go. Male, women. Now, they were dealing with the sexual drive and sexual impulses and people with them. And so he laid out all these kind of rules about like keeping separated and doing this and doing that. But the original, like, let's not forget the original message though, is that this was one of the first religious teachers on the scene that was saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're male, if it's not, that's not the point. Do you have a mind? You have a suffering mind? Great, you're in it. Come on. Like that's, that was sort of the, the criteria there. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I also yeah. think uh, that I heard that she had to ask three times um, and mostly because he kept saying, you know, the thing is we're forest monks. You're not going to be safe. And mm. th there, there's three aspects of, you know why he needed to lay down some some sure. ground rules in order to protect wandering mendicant women <laughs> yep. you know but that being said they also had to you know make rules about like don't have sex with corpses and, and like you know there's all kinds of weird shit in the vinaya <laughs> exactly and let's not forbid forget one of the best rules where, where he said where, about the part where if the rules are not working forget them forget them <laughs> yeah, actually, what, how brilliant. They said, hey, and by the way, if these rules are not working for your community, you can forget them. <laughs> so um, I'm so glad you're here tonight. This is such a great uh, place for you to be, a great sutra for us all to be listening to. So um, any other questions, comments, ideas? Because we got to talk to some emptiness. We got to talk emptiness tonight. Um, I was kind of gearing up for it. So in order to do that, we're going to be introduced to our first, uh, um, this sort of uh, priracha, or as it was called, the question, the questioning, that I already mentioned is a kind of a part of the Ratnakuta Sutras, is the kind of questioning. So hearing, hearing his daughter drop, <laughs> say all that, King Ajatashatru sank into silence <laughs> at that time the venerable shariputra right considered the wisest of the shravakas had this thought ashoka datta so eloquent she's so eloquent that she can deliver such a boundless discourse let me step forward to ask her a few questions and I will find out whether she has realized the truth. Thereupon, Shariputra approached the maiden Ashokadatta and asked, 
do you abide in the Shravaka vehicle? Do you practice Theravada Buddhism? Are you a Theravada Buddhist? Are you a Hinayana Buddhist? Are you a Shravaka type of Buddhist? Ashoka Datta replied, no. Shariputra asked, do you abide in the solitary sagely vehicle, the Pratekya Buddha vehicle? She replied, no. <laughs> do you abide in the Mahayana, the great vehicle? <laughs> she replied, no. Shariputra asked further, then in what vehicle do you abide that you are able to make such a lion's roar? The maiden answered, Vener the maiden answered Venerable Shariputra, if I were abiding in anything right now, it would be impossible for me to make the lion's roar. Since I abide in nothing, I can make a lion's roar. However, Shariputra, you asked, in what vehicle do you abide? Does the Dharma realized and achieved by you, Shariputra, consist of different vehicles, such as a Shravaka vehicle, a Pratekya vehicle, and a great vehicle? Shariputra said, please listen to me. <laughs> All patronizing, right? Please listen to me. The Dharma I have realized has no such distinct signs as vehicle or no vehicle because it has only one sign namely signlessness venerable shariputra ashoka Datta said if the dharma is signless how can it be sought how how if it has no marks, characteristics, or qualities, how can it be sought? Shariputra replied, Ashokadatta, what is the difference in excellence between the Dharma of Buddhas and the Dharmas of ordinary people? Put it, put it a different way. What is the difference in, in excellence between the truth of Buddhas and the truth of ordinary people. So substituting truth for Dharma there, right? Ashoka Datta replied, what is the difference between emptiness and nirvana, quiescence? Ashoka, uh, I'm getting lost, who's who? Shariputra replied, there is no difference between emptiness and nirvana. Ashoka Datta replies, Shariputra, just as there is no difference in excellence between emptiness and total quiescence, so there is no difference in excellence between the truth of Buddhas and the truth of ordinary people. Furthermore, Shariputra, just as space, while embracing all forms, is not different from them, so the Dharma of Buddhas is not different from the Dharmas of ordinary people, nor can the two be distinguished by signs. Does this sound familiar just in its tone, <laughs> right? Very similar to Vimalakirti Sutra, very similar ideas. Again, though, I, I wanted to then use tonight to slow down, <laughs> unpack all of that. So. That we're only going to talk about Shariputra's little question and answer for the rest of the night, I promise. Hold off. So at the very beginning of the sutra, it said that all the bodhisattvas, which is going to include Ashoka Datta, that they had all penetrated, I believe was the verb. Penetrated was the verb. They had all penetrated well into the three doors of liberation. Okay, and, and it says it in the opening that they had penetrated into emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness. And the little uh, repartee here between Shariputra and Ashoka Datta was about the signless, right? And to a certain degree about emptiness and to a certain degree about wishlessness. So I want to 
kind of use Shariputra and Ashoka Dutta's back and forth to talk about this fundamental Buddhist idea, this, this is essential Mahayana Buddhism here. Um, uh, um, you know, again, it mentions it at the beginning, and this was a big part of the Vimalakirti Sutra was, was these three doors of liberation. Now, if you've never heard of these, um, well, you're going to find out all about them tonight. Um, but if, if this is your first time hearing me talk about them, then you may not have heard me reference them this way, or you may not have heard them referenced this way. In the earlier uh, Shravaka-esque Theravada type Buddhism, so in the early type of Buddhism, there were these three called the three seals or the three marks of reality. And it was these ideas that, well, that all phenomena, you know, whether it's a, whatever it is, a telephone, ice cream cone, a warm, fuzzy feeling, an idea, a memory, all these different things, although they appear to have different qualities or characteristics, right? You know, if, or if you just think of people, you know, some people are tall, some people are short, some people are like this, some people are like that. Like all of these different qualities. Well, the original teaching of the Buddha emphasized this idea that all phenomena actually have these kind of three shared qualities. <laughs> that they're all ultimately without a, a self, um, an Atman. And that's sort of technical, but it really just, if you want to think of it simply, it means that there's no es essence or essential piece or part of anything, right? I often use like my clock, but the idea that there's no essential part of it, it has no essential piece, that's like an Atman, that there's no essence, everything is like a ball of foam, would be the Buddhist simile there. So the original three marks or three seals was that everything ultimately doesn't have a, a, an, a, a something underneath. It's all sort of a collection of lakshana or a collection of qualities without an essential quality. So that's called selfless. So all things were without a self, right? All things were impermanent. You know, my clock is falling apart all the time. Parts are breaking, it's falling apart. So it's impermanent. There's no essential part of it. And ultimately, it's a source of dukkha or a source of suffering. Those were the three old school Shravaka style Buddhist, the way to see reality and sort of the right view, if you will, the right view of reality was that you should see all individuated phenomena, whether it's a pen, pair of glasses or whatever, you should see any phenomena as not having an essential part, an essentialness, essential nature, that it's all impermanent, no matter what it is, it's fleeting. And that ultimately, because of those two things, actually, <laughs> because it's fleeting, and because ultimately, there's nothing there, there, it's a source of suffering, a source of frustration, it will never be satisfactory, it will never be satisfying the way that you really want it to be because it doesn't actually possess the qualities you think isn't actually even there and is ultimately fleeting. That's Dharma. That's wisdom. Solid. You, you can't mess with it. It's like, that is the teaching. That's the old teaching. But a few things happened in Buddhism. One thing that happened is, is that in the Mahayana tradition, they kind of were like, well, basically, this, this view that everything is a source of suffering got a little, it was a little like kind of a downer. It, it kind of seems to have drifted into a very, like, approximating a nihilistic type of, you know, it's either escape from this world, definitely view everything in this world as bad. Like, it just started to, like, you know, I, I tried to be a good Dharma teacher just now by trying to get you excited about those three ideas and then take them right away from you, right? Because they are wise. 
it is wisdom. And you sh we should think about the impermanence of all things. We should think about the unsatisfactory nature of things. We should think about the nature of things. Like, that's true. But it's also true that if you spend too much time in those, those mindsets, you know, that it, it, you can start to get a little down in terms of this world. And so in the Mahayana tradition, the way that I teach it, is that they sort of, they didn't ab abandon or dismiss those three signs I just told you about, but they got very excited, much more excited about passing through these liberatory experiences or these liberatory gateways of emptiness, not self, not selflessness, anatman, but shunyata, emptiness, right? Not impermanent, signless, which I want to talk about, and then not suffering, but ultimately kind of undesirable. Wishlessness is tricky, and I'm going to go through each of these quickly, or not quickly, I'm going to spend, you know, basically a half hour talking about it, but I want to kind of start to present them to you. For many in the, in the room, the, these are old, these are familiar ideas, right? And individually, they might be familiar ideas. And then as these sort of three doors of liberation as a, as an, as a concept, they might be familiar to you. St you know, it's a tricky one because there's a way in which they, they really work together. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to have a little fun tonight. I want to try a new, um, what is this? Uh, it's a, meta, a metaphor, simile. It's some one of those. It's a, it's a, st a story, um, and it's a new story to try to talk about emptiness in a slightly interesting new way. Talk about the signless, right? So, for the number of years, the last um, five, six years, or whatever, um, up until recently. Um, I had been working as an archivist. I worked in an archive. And what an archive is, if you don't know, is it's basically like a museum, but it's not open to the public. So everything is just sort of stored, right? Um, and what you do as an archivist is you, well, you count things, you catalog things, you collect data on things, and then you pack things up very nicely, carefully for all of eternity, and figure out ways to prevent them from deterioration and decay, from impermanence and all that, right? Um, I'm actually not trying to make a funny Buddhist jokes yet. Um, so part of that job that was very, very interesting was being presented with a variety of different collections of items. Um, you know, um, very like people would donate collections of butterflies or they would co donate collections of like antique whatever um this was to the the museum that i worked at and then my job was to go through and catalog all the items and and the idea it was about like you know let's say i was going to catalog an item and it I'll, it instantly became kind of an interesting philosophical conundrum of like, is this one thing or is it two things? And what I mean by that is, is that um, I've got a bunch of these. So should I catalog all the batteries? Cause these batteries were, are not original part of this. The battery was made somewhere else. The battery actually has tox toxic stuff in it. So it needs to be stored separately. And so deciding whether this is part of this or not, was, became very interesting in terms of finding where does the clock begin and end. So I want to present you with a, uh, it's like a theoretical situation I was confronted with. This didn't really happen, but it very easily could have. Imagine as an archivist that I, we open up a, a big a vault and it's just full of books, floor to ceiling books, right? And, I, and we got to catalog and archive these books. We got to go through, right? And so we want to start coming up with a way to, you know, separate them out because it's got, there's all kinds of books, right? 
And so we start going through and we start getting confronted with very instantly an interesting question, which is what is a book? What makes a book? Does a book have a cover? Does a book have words? If, if it's a book of just numbers, is it still a book? Okay, so books don't just have words. Um, let me ask you this. Is a magazine a book? It's a magazine a book. It's got a cover. It's got words. I read it. Uh, so now imagine that we're like, well, we got to get, we got to get to cataloging all of these, uh, all these books, right? A vault. I'm telling you, it's a vault of books. But we start going through and we realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. Magazines are magazines are magazines. Everybody knows what a magazine is, right? So we're, we're going to put all the magazines over there and we're going to catalog all of those, right? Well, and then let's say I find this, this pile of um, uh, Sears catalogs, right? Old Sears catalogs. And I'm like, are, well, those aren't, those aren't books, they're catalogs. So now I'm putting all the catalogs over here and then I'm putting all the, the ledgers over here and all the diaries and journals over there and all the this over there. And, the, and I'll tell you what happens. By the time we're all done with this, there ain't a book in the vault. So, so, so that's funny, right? And I wanted to do that because I know that, you know, a lot of people are very interested in this idea, this Buddhist idea of emptiness. And as I often say, jokingly, you know, that when I, when I realize that the empty nature of things, it's not that they like turn into little clouds of smoke and disappear. And that the more enlightened I get, the more the less <laughs> things there are until i'm in like a dark black room of a void and now i'm enlightened because there's no more differentiated phenomena that's not what the buddhists are talking about at all so what i'm going to do now is walk you through the signless so the idea is is that in my example when i started with this idea of like well what makes a book a book how would i even know if I was looking at a book, right? Well, you know what a book is by its qualities or its characteristics that we have come to associate with them. Another example is a chair. What is a chair? Well, conceptually, a chair is a certain a collection of qualities or characteristics. I need to be able to sit on it. It's arguable whether it needs a back or not, right? Because I could have a vault full of chairs, <laughs> but pretty soon when I start putting the stools over there, and I start, <laughs> all the chairs go. So what I'm kind of doing is, is doing a, a, a funny game about these qualities or characteristics, they're called lakshana in Sanskrit. And the Buddhists talk a lot about lakshana. And so what's going on with this in terms of this is that, well, let's go back to my first example of the books. And then by the time I was done, there were no more books, right? So what happened to all the books? Where, where did those go? Because it's like, I know where all the catalogs and all the diaries and all the journals and all the magazines are, but where did all the books go, right? And the idea, of course, is, is they didn't go anywhere. They were never there in a way to begin with. That is emptiness. That is the empty nature of all phenomena that all phenomena are like those books that I disappeared from you. I disappeared them from your reality. And you know how I disappeared them from your reality is I took the lakshana away from them in that way. I started saying, well, no, no, no. We're going to call this kind of lakshana that. And we're going to call this kind of lakshana that. And so there's this really intimate relationship, of course, between all of these ideas. Where is it that it is the signs 
that are making me think it's the object. But I just told you that that object, that singular, that singular object that you have such a convenient word for, right? You have that one convenient word for that idea. But what is a clock, right? It is a, a series of lakshana, timekeeping. Does it need to have hands? No, it can have a, be a digital clock, right? Does it need to be on my wrist? No. So the idea is, is that if you think about signs or lakshana, qualities or characteristics, like if you think about them long enough, the object that they are qualities of <laughs> starts to reveal its empty nature, which is that it's, 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 it isn't actually. <laughs> what it is, is a conventional, convenient way of holding a bunch of lakshana, a bunch of characteristics together in your mind. So, oh, but hold on, I'm gonna flip it on you. I'm gonna flip it on you because what happens is, is that if you just followed me on the, the, the books that are no, they're not there anymore, right? If you, just, if you followed me on that, there, there are no books. There's, no, there's nothing to have signs then either. Right, because if it's, if, and, but, and then just to, to, if, if, if the Lakshana show me that there's nothing underneath, it's all emptiness, and therefore there's nothing to have any signs to begin with, what could you possibly want out there? You want a book? You want a chair, Shariputra, right? So that's where you get to the wishlessness. This is in what's so fascinating about the Bodhisattva path, what's so fascinating about Apranihita, Apranihita, the wishlessness, it's not saying, bad human, you shouldn't want anything. It's actually saying, you know what's funny? There's nothing there to want. You know that, you know, it's, isn't that funny? So this is not, again, it's not punitive. It's not even, it's just a realization that there's nothing there to be wanted. All it is, is a bunch of qualities or characteristics that are in my head already. They are my differentiation. They are my discrimination. They are my consciousness. So therein lies this sort of triple fold practice of seeing all phenomena as empty, therefore without signs, and therefore desireless. No, um, no desire. And I need to mention this. <clears throat> All three of these, in a very interesting way, and, and this, is a, this is an opaya, this is like a pedagogy for understanding these. All three of these, when, when, we are, when we are just starting out bodhisattvas, right? Entry level. All three of these, it's helpful to understand them um, cutting two ways. And what I mean by that is, is that anything that you are looking at, clocks, chairs, books, anything out there is empty without signs and is, is not, it's, it's desireless. But those same three go for the, the, the one who thinks they're perceiving a clock or a chair or a book. Empty also, also signless, not male, not, not these characteristics or qualities. So signless, empty, and ultimately wishless. Now, what the point I wanted to make about that, about the way a pranihita wishlessness works, this is a very 
um, seemingly simple lesson. From my point of view, what this means is that I shouldn't want, like, wish, have wishes, wants, desires for things, craving things. Got it. That's like, that's Dharma. But the, the flip side of this, um, wishlessness is a very rough, hard, it's not it. Um, uh, uh, the great Vietnamese um, master Thich Nhat Hanh, he does aimlessness. Aimless. And it's a beautiful practice he does about aimless walking. It's like a walking meditation and trying not to like head towards anything. So yeah, it's about wanting and grasping, but it's also this, this wishlessness is also about um, like plans and, and like, like, like mapping out the future and wanting things to be a certain way in the future. And then of course the Buddhist wisdom of that is that that's like a classic way to suffer. It's a classic way to get let down is to kind of do that. Right. So yes, this third door of liberation, the wishlessness is, is about you, the practitioner, not grasping, not wanting, not wishing, not planning. But interestingly, as a practice, it's also very helpful to see all phenomena as pointless. Without a purpose, without a long-term goal, without a use value, without an aesthetic value, without any kind of relativity. And it's very interesting the way that if you look at something um, as having a point, as having a purpose, it's interesting to see purpose as a lakshana, as like a quality that it's like, oh, it's, it's a, uh, it's round, it's round, it's red, and it is to be eaten, right? So that is its purpose. And of course, I'm referring to an apple, of course, because that is what is round, red, and to be eaten. That is its, its purpose, that is its aim or its goal. And so the bodhisattva practice is actually to see all things as not having a specific goal that might be in my favor or might be relative to my aesthetic or might be relative to my values, but to actually view all things as not necessarily perfect already, not necessarily, this practice is about seeing all things as being without a purpose in that way. Meaning that any purpose is being projected onto it by my mind. It is not inherent in the object. That's, that's questions about the three doors. I know that was sort of, you know, lots to nibble on. No, I, th hi, uh, Michael. Hi, Connie. I think it, I think it's just so fascinating because uh, what comes to my mind is like that an object or an idea of an object is never the problem, you know, like the chair is never the problem or whatever you, the apple itself is never the problem, no matter what, if I understand its nature or not. It's always, and that's what you pointed out at the very end of this um, part of your talk, which I think was so essential. It's always the relation you have to the object, right? The emotion is never the problem. It's always the relation to, and then suffering. I've heard a talk by Ram Das this morning, really beautiful. And um, he pointed out that suffering comes only always in relation to someone or something. And um, yeah, I just wanna, wanted to point that out. And I'm glad that you mentioned it at the very end because I think that's essential. Thank you. Thank you. That was good, great comment. Thank you. Okay, everybody good? So, Another, you know, another funny thing to think about when it comes to all of this is, so if you want to go back to my vault, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you want to go back to my vault of all the books, right? So this, this was kind of a, 
a joke I would make to my uh, my supervisor when I was working in the archive, right? Um, the, the joke happened often, but you could imagine it where we open the vault, right? And there's all the books and we got to get to cataloging all the books. And so then we start dividing them by their qualities or their characteristics into all of their respective piles until pretty soon we don't have any more books because that is now a you know, a lakshana monster. It's the, it's, it's gone. So the joke that I would say to my supervisor is we open up the vault and I go, one library, check, <laughs> done. And again, that was kind of a, would have often happen where I would be presented with a giant box of things. And I, and I would say, can't I say just one collection of X, right? Now I make the joke again, but it's, it's to kind of push us even to a more slightly a more interesting place where, so I started off with this vault of books, plural, right? And then each individual book, based on its qualities or its characteristics turned in kind of turned into something else right it turned into a ledger or a journal based on its qualities or characteristics right so that's kind of interesting this idea that like it's sort of like the hand fist phenomena right where it's like is it a hand is it a fist when where did the fist go does the hand does the hand cease to be when there's the you know it's like it's sort of along that lines where the book becomes a ledger or whatever. But then that last example where all of the books are the, a, a library, right? And, and there's this way that there's this way that the mind can do that. Yes. The mind can do that. It can, it can, um, what, you know, do we have a word in English for like singularify, singularification, right? It, it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like unification or whatever, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this idea of like, <laughs> you, know, you know, just like, oh, it's just one and we'll call it a library, right? Oh, it's just... It's, it's a bunch of people and books and teachers and this and that. We'll call it a school. Oh, it's a, you know, it's like, but what I want you to, to be like thinking about is what's going on there with the singularification of phenomena that way, right? Where it's like, oh, it's a bunch of books, but it is a library. Or it, let's say it's a bunch of words, but it's a book right? Well, it's a bunch of cells, <laughs> but it's a person. Or it's a bunch of five skandhas, but it's a person. And so in that same way that you, yeah, you can have a library and I can go into a library. I could check books out and libraries are real. I've been to, I love libraries, right? Well, sentient beings are real in that sense. Amalgamations of five skandhas are real in that same sense where they are both real and not real. I just showed you how they're real and not real in that way. Cause the mind can do that. The mind can singularify stuff, right? Questions about the process of singularification? Uh, kind of to like circle back to your three doors of liberation. And I think it's kind of inherent in the way that you framed like the second door of signlessness, but I think it has like really interesting implications for like literary theory and like interpretations using like Derrida or like Desaussure to kind of like understand like what, it, it's just like, it's mind blowing to think about like all of these like ideas about language and how this really kind of deconstructs that notion that we even have language or like why we use language. So it's fascinating. Thank you. Great comment. And I'm so happy that you're picking that up, that that is, that is totally what's going on here. Buddhism and the uh, 
the Dharma. They're very on top of the language game. Like look out Wittgenstein, like they were on it a long time ago. And so their treatment of language is very, very sophisticated. And it's very subtle. Like it's, it's what I'm saying, but this idea that a library is, we is real and you can go into it and I'm real and all of that. But I just showed you how there's no books, no library, no chairs, no stools. No, it's like, oh, then what's happening here? <laughs> so, awesome. And, and, and the applications to literary theory and all kinds of other worlds, like just this way of thinking can be applied to like so many other fields. So thanks again, too, for that. Totally, yeah. Um, so, and oh, you go first. This was just a brief, brief question. Uh, Michael, um, your example about the library and the books that ties to the um, difference between relative truth and absolute truth or relative reality and absolute reality, right? Okay, thank you. That is what's called the doctrine of two truths in Buddhism, this sort of relative truth of books and libraries and this sort of absolute truth of, of emptiness because everything is sort of a lakshana party. But the doctrine of two truths, the, the, the real profundity of that teaching is that one should not favor one of those over the other. They are understood to be two, two sides of a coin that it's like, you know, and it's not about abandoning the compounded for the uncompounded. And it's not about drifting off, you know, it's... It's about this delicate balance between understanding the relationship between phenomena and this emptiness thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah and then, Tania, you had something? That pretty much answered my question about the emptiness and the two truths, because I was just going to ask about the emptiness, but I think Sweet. I get it. And I hope, I hope everybody appreciated the sort of the new approach to this, you know, um, not your- Yeah, this was fascinating. Great. I, have, I, will, keep, I will keep it in the repertoire. Um, any other last questions, comments? I think that the board, your whiteboard, really helps explain these concepts. Like they're so simple, but it just it really helps illustrate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, on that note, uh, we only got up to Shariputra and she, our, our hero, our heroine, is questioned actually by five of, of the monks. So next week, I'm gonna uh, keep going with this a wonderful sutra. We actually didn't even get to the, the real juicy stuff. We didn't get to hear more about her jeweled shoes. She has these gold jeweled shoes. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> so, uh, so see you next Sunday. All right, bye. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you, Michael. My so pleasure. we have one last question that came in from the chat, oh, cool. um, which is, do you have a recommendation about the best version of the text? To there's, only one, there's only one. That, that's easy then. <laughs> it's, it's in the gram, in the gram, or Chung, sorry, Chung is the translator. Okay. And I am, it's around here somewhere, I've got, I got the Chinese, we're doing it, I'm doing my own. Um, this one's pretty good, I have to say. Um, uh, I, I, I like the, a lot of the language, so I don't change as much here. Um, but we are folks also um, basically gearing up to spend a lot of time in the in the treasury, <laughs> rolling around in the jewels. Uh, so we're going to do another night, at least another night on on Ashoka Data. But then there's all kinds of other bodhisattvas in this collection, and so uh, there's too much too many jewels in here that the world hasn't seen yet. So we're going to spend some time on that. So. Thank you, Michael. Yep. And I'll say a couple words about Donna, you know, here at the collective, we're a whole bunch of meditators and we're one collective <laughs> and we're made of everyone who's ever uh, 
come through the doors, come through the Dharma doors, come into the Zoom. Um, we're all one big Lakshana party of meditators and Dharma practitioners. And that community is created out of nothing by Donna. It is, Donna is the practice that creates and sustains our community. Um, so there are some links in the chat if you would like to practice Donna. Um, tonight, if your money is better used elsewhere, please put it elsewhere and keep coming back. Um, we are here uh, doing Dharma doors every week. We have meditation every single day um, and all are always welcome um, regardless of financial means. So we look forward to seeing you again. Um, oh, and Michael Owens's uh, website is in the chat also. So check that out. He has a SoundCloud and he does private um, tutoring. And um, so, yeah, come back on Sunday. We'll see you then and uh, check out our website. And I'm so glad that we got to share this space together tonight. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Great to see you. Night, Michael. Be well. Thank you.